Father, in the name of Jesus, thank, thank you for our children. Thank you, Father, for a generation of those that will carry the cross. Those that love your name, love your wills, and love your ways. We pray your blessing upon them. We pray that you would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Give your angels charge concerning their well-beings in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Man, I'm stoked about this. I am so excited about uh, the next phase of what's happening here. But before we get into that, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in the first chapter. We're going to start off in the 17th verse and go to the 29th verse. But And while you turn and find your place there, and for those of you who don't have your Bibles, we'll throw it up on the screen for you. Don't fret. A um, couple of things that's happening in our church that I want to make you guys aware of. First of all, if you happen to miss a Sunday service, which I know you probably won't, but it just in the event that you might, um, we are now we're now running uh, the videos. We're now running videos of the sermons online. Okay, so if you go to our website, Waterbrook Community Church, you can check out last week's sermon. If you happen to miss one and you're in a sermon series and you're out of town or something, visiting them grandbabies or visiting, uh, you know, doing what you do, whatever that is, um, then you may miss a sermon and in the midst of it, you can go back online and also, um, and, and watch a sermon. We also have an element on the, on the website now where you can online giving where you can give online as well. So, um, and I have been totally amazed. Man, we've got, we, we may have to plant a church in Brazil because there's like 30 or 40 people that are checking out the sermons every week in Brazil. So, um, it's amazing. And there was like 30 in Russia too, but we found out they were all just hackers. They were just trying to hack the site. So, they weren't really watching the sermons. They were just trying to get into the site for some reason. I don't know why, but... But the Brazilian church may be a real deal, so, you know, we have to look into it. Um, road trip! <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the, the other thing is, too, this week, uh, Session has been working really diligently, um, working on the budget for our church this upcoming year. And um, there are a lot of things, obviously, that's changed in our church. And uh, so our budget has reflected that. Uh, we're putting a couple of finishing touches on it, and then that budget will be made public to to you guys. There will be a congregational meeting on it. Everybody will have budgets in hands, um, and you'll be able to kind of ask any questions. I don't have any dates for you right now is when, when that's coming down the pipe, but I have never seen session meetings where people are so excited to do budget stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's like being excited about doing your taxes, right? I mean, uh, so uh, uh, it just a lot of things is coming, but we will the, the budgets will be made public. You'll be able to pick up copies of them in the office. They'll be on the website, whatever. I mean, wherever you want to grab a hold of them, they'll be out there for for you to view. And uh, we're going to be going over some stuff too. Okay. So uh, also, real quick, and I was just made aware of this too. The the youth tonight, if you've got a youth, they're going to be at the Rolls House. All right, so pray for Greg and Brandy as our youth group heads over to their house. Um, but I'm sure they'll have a great time. I wish I was younger so I could go tonight too. So, um, Are you guys in 1 Corinthians? Okay, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. These are Paul's words to the church in Corinth. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, meaning that salvation is a point in place, and we talk about this, and we're going to talk about this in a great deal today. Salvation is a point in place where you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, where you may, you you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. There was a point in a time and a day when that happened. All right, but that's not the totality of salvation is what Paul is saying here. There is more to salvation than just one time making a decision for Jesus Christ. There is, Paul talks about it, it is an active type thing. You are, you are being saved, right? We are cursed constantly in, in Romans 1 16 Paul talks about how how we are constantly working out our salvations in Christ Jesus 
So you are saved from the decision you made that day. But there are constantly things that God's working on me and you on in our lives. Amen? I mean, nobody's arrived, have they? If you have, raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I want to get some notes from you on how you got there because I'm not quite with you there yet. But we're, we're, we're in the process of being saved. Paul talks about this. This is some really meaty stuff. and Well, we'll get into it more. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing. The understanding of the prudent. That is from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 29, 14 or 15. I think it's 14. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God I'm going to stop periodically and speak into some of these things. We see this a lot today in our society. And if you visit um, chat rooms, if you visit, if you comment on godly type articles, um, or if you Facebook, you're always going to have one or two people that are detractors of, of what you're saying, that say that the Bible's not true, and they usually come at it from an intellectual point of view. They, they think the Bible is just fables, they think it's myths, they think it's just old-timey stories, and they think, and they base, the, largely, not, not everyone, but a large amount of people base it on the fact that they're smarter than that. They, they do. They, 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 they'll cite scientific reasons, they'll cite other things, and they'll say, well, you know, you know I, I've grown beyond children's fables or old-timey stories. Or because they can't explain something, then they deem it not to be truth. We see it all the time in our society today. We see a lot of people that disclaim things, and that's what Paul's talking about here when he says, and let me speak into this for a minute because I know there are some of you out there because I'm one of them. I'm not, don't worry about defending God. God's a big boy. He can defend himself. <laughs> right? Now, that's not saying, now listen, don't, don't take it the wrong way because I know where some people are thinking. That, you know, it's not saying you shouldn't ever speak up or you shouldn't ever, do, you know, that's not saying that. It's just saying that you don't, don't get into arguments with people about stuff like that. I mean, you, you really don't have to because the Bible says here, and we're getting ready to read, read it, that it pleases God to confound or to confound the wise with what they think is foolishness. It actually, it actually pleases God. Can you see God giggling? It pleases God. I mean, and the fact is, the bottom line is that one day every knee will bow. And it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. So, and I get into this sometimes. I used to do it a lot when I was young. I, I would argue with people. I'd be in the grocery store parking lot arguing with people or, or you know, arguing with them online. You know, and, and I, you know, I think there are good debates, and I think you can have those. But be careful about being such a staunch Christian defender that it makes you look foolish sometimes. It pleased God through the foolishness, listen, of the message preached to save those who believe. You know, there were some of you, when you got saved, you didn't understand it all, did you? I didn't either. It says it pleases God. Those that they don't understand it all, but yet they can still step out in faith. For Jews request a sign, meaning the, the Jews look for miraculous signs that a Messiah was coming. And because they didn't see that sign, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And the Greeks 
Seek after wisdom. That means, meaning the Greeks in the biblical time, they were all about cognitive knowledge. They were all about what you had learned. Could you eloquently speak? How could you debate? Could you defend your points? It was all about book learning. It was all about knowledge. And that's why God coming as a man and being crucified on a cross made no sense. But we'll preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it is a stumbling block, and to the Greeks it is foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brothers, that not many wise according to the flesh. Not many were mighty. Not many were noble. I mean, when you and I got saved, God didn't call you because of you were something great and I was something great, you know, and God said, man, that person would be really cool to be in the kingdom. <laughs> I think I'm going to choose them. You know, it wasn't like how you do on the, on the you know, how you do in the sand lot when boys pick baseball teams. Well, he's the best. I'm going to take him first. And then you'd always take the nerdy kid last like me. You take him, they take him last, right? And, 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 and it, God didn't do that. Because none of us were noble. None of us were great. None of us were eloquent. We were all just... <laughs> sinners, I guess. Is the word I'm looking for. But God has chosen the foolish things. That means... Meaning... Right? The foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in, its pres in his presence. But of him... You are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Today we are going to be talking uh, in a two-part, in, in part of our series, we're talking about the cross. And uh, we're into the first part of it today. We're going to talk specifically about the cross of Jesus Christ. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know that some of the stuff that we're going to hear today may be new to some people. And Father, it may be old to others. Father, I pray that you would make it fresh, though, to all of our hearts. That you would speak, Father, into the darkness um, and make light. Father, that you would reveal to us truth. And Father, that it wouldn't just become something that we place upon a shelf in the hollows of our lives, but that we would use it as a catalyst to propel us into a service for the kingdom of God. To realize, Lord, that you are greater than anything else that we will ever encounter. That there is nothing like you. The fact that you came as a man is a revelation that seems so foolish to so many and yet so profound to others. Father, speak to our hearts today, I pray. Help us to not leave here the way we entered. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. There are, um, th there are, there are two crosses, really, that are central to Christianity when we start to talk about the cross and when we start to talk about the abundant life. There is the cross of Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about today. It's the cross that we sang about that Greg and the Praise and Worship Band did an awesome job of, of, of talking about. It's the cross where our Savior bled and died. It's the cross that brings life. It's the old rugged cross. Amen. It, it's, it's a cross where... Um, God came as a man and he hung and he shed his precious blood for the salvation of all who will come. 
And then there's a second cross, which is the cross that you and I have to carry. That's a cross we're going to talk about next week when Jesus talks about how um, anyone who wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and follow me and pick up his. We're going to talk about that cross next week. We're going to talk really about how both of these crosses bring you and I into the abundance of life. Because both of the crosses are gateways or are keys or doors to the, to the abundant life that Jesus was talking about. And when, when we talk about, um, I, got a, I got a theory about the cross of Jesus Christ. You want to hear it? Good. <laughs> like a little more enthusiasm next time I ask, but that's okay. We'll go with it anyway. It's all I got right now, so I'm going to go with it. Um, <clears throat> The cross of Jesus Christ is the most paradoxical thing in the universe. Now, when I mean paradoxical, that comes from the word paradox, which the word parrot, how many knows what paradox means? Okay. <laughs> Listen, I didn't either until I looked it up in Webster's. I didn't know it. Paradox means it is something that has two meanings, and yet the meanings are opposites, and yet they are still truth. One's just as true as the other. Okay, are you confused enough yet? Basically this, it, it, let's boil it down to a nutshell. Um, something that's paradoxical meaning it has two dual truths and they're the opposites of each other. And when I say the cross of Jesus Christ is paradoxical, let me give you an example of the word paradoxical. Let me just do that. Some men think that uh, understanding women are, is easy. <laughs> but yet they find out it's quite hard. Therefore, it is paradoxical to them. Right? Now let me use it again for you. Women don't find understanding men to be paradoxical at all. In fact, it's quite simple. Right? There's two examples of... I'm going to move on from that real quick because it... That did not go over as well as it looked like it was going to go over on paper. Let me give you some examples of why the cross of Jesus Christ is paradoxical. All right? And, I, and, and rather than just say them to you real quick. I, I decided we're going to throw them up here for you. The cross of Jesus Christ is paradoxical in the fact that it, throw them up, Mike, it adds and it subtracts. It added to you God's grace and God's mercy. But it subtracted from you God's wrath and judgment. The cross of Jesus Christ is physical, yet it is perpetual. It was a physical point and place in time where a Savior, where Jesus of Nazareth, he hung, he bled, and he died. And yet it is perpetual. It stands throughout time. People will still come to it today. It has, it, it is, has just as much power that comes from it the day that our Savior hung on it and, and, and bled a crimson flow that fell down at people's feet that didn't care for it. It will save people today. It is physical, but yet it's perpetual. It stands the test of time. The cross of Jesus Christ is paradoxical in the fact that it speaks of love and hate. It speaks of God's love for you. It speaks of God's love for me. It speaks of God's love for all of mankind. Yet it speaks of his hatred of sin and evil. And how Paul tells us he abhors it. The cross of Jesus Christ is paradoxical in the fact that it is a bridge and yet it is a divide. It will bridge, 
It will bridge the most ranked sinner to a holy God. And yet Jesus tells us that it will divide father from son, mother from daughter. It marks a point in place in time, and yet the cross is not constrained by time. It marks a point in place in time where Jesus defeated the principalities of darkness. And yet, for anyone who still would come, it embraces them with grace and love. It's, it's, it, is, it is a source of life and death. It crucified our Savior and it showed no mercy. And yet, for all who will cling to it, it exudes to them the very life of God. I call it the abundant life. I could go on and on, but to me, it is the most paradoxical thing in the universe. And for those... Let me give you another paradox about it, too. I was thinking about it this morning in prayer. For some people, they, people will cling to it and others will flee from it. For those that cling to it, they realize the love of a Savior, but there are others that it disturbs them to no end. And they flee from it at every particular chance they get. Did I have more up there? Oh, I do. It will spare no one, yet it welcomes everyone. We will all have to answer for the truth that we found out and that we know about the cross of Jesus Christ. It will spare no one in those regards. And yet it welcomes any who will come to it. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what, you, what kind of pain you're going through or burdens, all are welcome to come. It is condemning, yet freedom flows from it. It is condemning to a world that says anything goes. It is condemning to a world's ideals and a world's ideologies and a world's philosophies that says, no, there has to be a moral and a spiritual line drawn somewhere in the sand, and it starts at the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and it, it will condemn a world's actions. Yet freedom flows from it to everybody that will come to it. The freedom of love and grace and mercy and of a Savior that wants what's best for them. The cross is full of light. It's full of truth. Yet it casts a shadow across all of humanity. Ever since the gospel became in written form, it has been persecuted and condemned. And yet, it has never been squashed. I'm telling you, it's just my opinion, and I think I'm stating a pretty strong case. It is the most paradoxical thing in the universe. Why is that such a big deal? Well, because in this passage right here too, Paul also talks about how there is a power that comes from the cross. There is a, there is a power of God that flows from the cross of Jesus Christ. There, there is a, Paul calls it, um, he mentions two different times, there is a power, that, a power of God, but he also talks about how there is a wisdom of God too. And God's wisdom is paradoxical in many ways, isn't it? And Paul, I mean, God talks about that in Isaiah when he says, you know, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And the way that I do things aren't the way, I'm paraphrasing, the way I do things aren't the way that you do things. 
I mean, praise God for that. Amen. So, and he says, my, God takes it a step further. And he goes, my ways are higher than your ways. And you know, what God is saying to me is that my, my wisdom is paradoxical in some ways, meaning that it, it won't make sense to people that try to figure it out all the time. There just has to be sometimes an element of faith that you must take it by. And the cross of Jesus Christ is the same way. To me, there are, this is going to be one of the shortest sermons I ever preach. I'm, I'm going to tell you all that right now. And some of y'all say, you too late. <laughs> but really, the message of the cross speaks for itself. It just does. It preaches itself. There, there are two things that I think, well, there are more. There are two things I feel led to talk about today that I think are the wisdom of God and the power of God which comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to take you to those two places, okay? And, and the first one is going to be, um, you got it up there for us, Mike? The first one is going to be Ephesians chapter 2. So if you're in Corinthians, go right. Okay? You'll get to Galatians, Ephesians. All right? And then when you get to Ephesians, just stay there. We're going to keep moving right after we get through Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Give, give me an amen when you get there. Okay. Therefore, remember that you were... I don't know, man. We're going to 14, right? We're going to be in 14. You got 14, Mike? That's good. Okay. I wanted to go ahead and take it further in, but we'll, we'll go from 14. For he himself, he's talking about Jesus here, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commands contained in ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. How many of you, that makes no sense. <laughs> Good, thank you for your honesty. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the what? Through the cross. Therefore, putting to death the enmity... And he came and he preached peace to those who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Okay, what in the world is Paul talking about here? Well, Paul, Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus here, and he is talking to them about how the fact when God gave Moses the law or the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament... Y'all know what those are? Thou shalt not. When God gave those to Moses, what happened was God gave those to Moses as, as, a, as a couple of things. One of them was a standard that he wanted people to know of what, when people say, what does God consider righteousness? God said, here it is. Hit it. Here's the mark of righteousness. Paul tells the church in Galatians that the law is like a mirror. And as we look into the law, it gives us an accurate reflection of ourselves. Which I'm going to tell you, ain't pretty. Right? Because here's the deal, and we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to pitch my tent and spend a long time on it. You haven't just broken one of the commandments. We've broke them all. Right? Come on, own it. We broke them all. Well, so when you, when you look at that, then you say, well, what am I to do? I've broken God's law. I've transgressed God's law, which means I have, you know, I have 
willfully broken God's law sometimes, and then I have unwillfully, meaning by mistake, I've just broken it at other times. But I've broken God's law. And, and he, here's the thing about that. Don't become so comfortable with the idea and the solution because we already know what the answer is, but don't, don't let that lose its all and its power. You see, here's the deal. Even if man in his wisdom realized he needed a savior, let's just say by some, some think tank somewhere came up with the fact that said, you know what, we figured it out. We have transgressed God's law. We're sinners. We're, we're, not only do we have a sinful nature because of the choice that Adam and Eve made a long time ago, and everybody that's been born since then has been born with that same sinful nature that's been passed down through generations and generations and generations. Not only do we have this sinful nature, right? Because you don't have to teach a two-year-old to be bad. You've got to teach them to be good. That's why we know we have a sinful nature. We're more inclined to do bad than we are good. Not only do we have a sinful nature, but we have transgressed God's law. Let's say we had a think tank somewhere that came up and said, you know what, we figured out we're sinners. And the only way for us to get to a holy and righteous God, a God who, can't, a God who doesn't condone sin, a God who can't look upon sin, the only way we can do that is we got to come up with a sinless, spotless person. Where would we do that? If, even if we knew the answer, we couldn't come up with the solution. And here's the thing. You and I know the answer, but don't become so familiar with it that it loses its all. That it loses its wonder. That it loses its fact that it was a miracle. And that it was a huge act of God's grace and love and mercy. So, and, and golly, here's what I want you to see. Don't, don't miss this too, okay? This is going to be boring stuff right here. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. This is a disclaimer. Don't go to sleep, but it's boring. All right, you ready? The law, you know, if you get to talk to them about biblical scholars, the law can be broken down into a couple of different areas or phases, but I'm just going to do it too for, just for sake of time. There, there's the ceremonial part of the law, and then there's the moral part of the law. Okay? And Jesus met both. We talk a lot about how Jesus met the moral part of the law, meaning that Jesus, he paid a price for you and I. We morally transgressed God's commandments. You and I, we've all done it. Amen. And Jesus paid that price. That's what we talk about all the time, how Jesus paid the price on the cross. Jesus paid the price on the cross for your sins and for my sins. Right? For our moral transgressions. But then there's another part of the law, the ceremonial part of the law, and that's God's end of the law. And that part of the law says this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22. Now, I'm just going to ask a question. You don't have to answer it. Why does there have to be the shedding of blood in order for the remission of sins? It's a great question. Thank you, Becky. Because... When Adam and Eve sinned against God, the Bible tells us that they knew they were naked and that God went out and provided coverings for them. Right? Where did God get the coverings? The price of innocent animals. Their blood was shed. Now, now listen, we're, I'm gonna tile, we're going to tile this in, but here's what I want you to see. God covered up physically. He covered Adam and Eve up then. 
the root word for covering there is the same root word that is for the Hebrew word that means atonement. It means to cover one's sin. Okay? Now, from that point on, the sacrificial ceremonial part of the law was put in place for Israel. And so on the Day of Atonement, they would take some little lamb that was spotless, that was sinless. They would take it up to the, they would take it to the tabernacle, or they would take it to the temple. They would hold it. They would slit that little lamb's throat. They would spill its blood out. They would take that blood that was gathered up. They would go into the Holy of Holies. We're going to talk about that here in a minute too. And that blood would, would make atonement for their sins. It would, it would cover up their sins. So when Jesus dies on the cross of Jesus Christ, he pays your end and my end of it morally, but he pays God's end of it. Now, he, and, and that word in the Greek is the word that we translate into reconcile. Let me show you the definition of reconciliation. The act of causing two people or groups to become friendly again after an argument or a disagreement. Look at the second part of this definition. The process of finding a way to make two different ideas, facts, etc. exist or be true at the same time. Sounds a lot like a paradox, doesn't it? I love it when a plant comes together! Woo! Go, Jesus! Boom! Man, that's good stuff. So the power of the cross is reconciliation for you and I. Listen, because Jesus dying on the cross, it satisfied our disobedient acts towards God, but it also, listen, it allowed a holy God who is without sin to now be in association with people who are. We have been reconciled. We have been reconciled. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been, it's for all. Turn with me. Let's go to the next scripture, Mike. The second part of the power that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ is in the book of Colossians. So if you're in Ephesians, just flip a couple of pages to the right. You'll go past Philippians, and you'll go to Colossians. Two thirteen through fifteen. And the second thing that the power that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ is victory over our sins. The first is reconciliation. Listen, don't miss the fact this is huge. The fact that you and I have been reconciled to God, back into a holy God. Our disobedience is not held against us. God's wrath will not come upon those who have accepted Christ by faith. It's huge. That's the clean slate. That's the beginning of a walk with Jesus Christ. But then we're gonna, we always run into the fact that, that we run into this fact of we have to run in because we live in a sinful world. Immediately our walk hits this obstacle of sin. And this passage of scripture today talks directly into that. And it really does, when we start to understand the theology behind it, it really does propel us into a victorious life with Christ. 
into the abundant life. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your, fa- of your flesh, he has made alive together. Jesus made you alive spiritually. He made you alive by, your, by forgiving you. He wiped out condemnation. You see, the problem with the Old Testament and the problem with the ceremonial law was that the atonement covered your sin, but it didn't deal with the shame and the guilt of your sin. Jesus does. And here's how. Having forgiven you of all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, that's the law that was against you because we've all broken it. For those that break the law, right? The penalty of sin is that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the Having disarmed, this is, this is the key to this, this passage is key for me. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. In what? In it. In being nailed to the cross. What does that mean? It means this. When the devil started it all in the third chapter of Genesis, when he tempted Adam and Eve and sin inject, was injected into the human race and into humankind, all the pain and the suffering and why do bad things happen to good people and the diseases and the plagues and the disasters and all those things entered into the human race through that sin. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross and when he died, that's the stopping point for what the devil started. Your sin's not held against you anymore because Jesus paid that price. He met the moral obligation. Your sins aren't held against you anymore in God's eyes anymore because Jesus paid the price for your sin and for my sin. And the hold that sin had on people at that time, it has no more because Jesus has defeated it. It has no power. Listen, Jesus has won the victory and it's up to you and I to walk into it. The next question is, how do you do that? Through faith. Through faith. This, I'm ending with this today. See, I told you it was, well, okay, it's not going to be short. <laughs> okay, Romans, Romans, 20, Romans 3. Okay, you're going to have to go back to the left. Let me, let me read this to you. I'm, guys, I'm going to try to move through it quick, but it, it's so exciting to me. Because once we begin to understand the power that's found in the cross of Jesus Christ and how it reconciles sinners back to a holy God and how we don't have to live in the bondage of sin. You don't have to live under the power of sin anymore because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Romans. Romans 3.21 But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed meaning that God revealed his righteousness in the law. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, has been revealed. Jesus came, he led a sinless, spotless life, he fulfilled the law. He met all of its requirements, he held true to all of it, that's why he could be a perfect, sinless, spotless sacrifice for you and I. Being witnessed by the law, meaning the the law bore witness that Jesus would come, that Jesus would fulfill it, and the prophets who did the exact same thing. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To who? To all. Not just some. Not some that God chose. To 
to all. To all and on all who what? Who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth, listen, as the propitiation by his blood through faith. That word propitiation, it means, um, it really means, when you boil it right down, it means, it means the mercy seat. You know what the mercy, the, the mercy seat in the Old Testament was the lid that sat on the Ark of the Covenant. You know the Ark of the Covenant? Indiana Jones, the Nazi boys was after the Ark of the Covenant. Now hear this out. Set, sitting in the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. All right? The law. The Bible tells us that sitting on top of the on the lid, there were these two cherubim, these angels that were laid prostrate out. And the Bible says that there was the presence of God. So see this middle picture. In the Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus would come, there's the law that sits in the Ark of the Covenant. There's the mercy seat or the lid that sits on top. Then there's the presence of God. Paul tells us that Jesus is the propitiation or the mercy seat. He is the go-between between God's law and God's presence. He is the in-between. In the Old Testament, he was the in-between. In the New Testament, now he is the in-between for you and I. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how good you've been or how bad you've been. We have all sinned before a holy God. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came, he led a sinless, spotless life, he bled, and he died on Calvary's cross. Now listen, and anybody that will receive him by faith, they too shall be saved. You will be reconciled back to a holy God. And listen, you're talking to somebody who was not a good person. And if God would do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. And this morning, it would be an injustice, a crime, to preach a story and to preach a sermon about the gospel of Jesus Christ and not give you a chance to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And it's done by faith. It's not done by a priest or a preacher. It's done by faith. And today, here's what I want to tell you. I want to give you the opportunity. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to, you know, point you out or single you out. But the Bible says it's by faith that we have to receive Christ Jesus. And you can do it sitting in your seat. But I think a bolder step of faith is to step up out of your seat to come forward. To ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And to ask Him to be the Lord of your life. And this morning, today is your day of salvation. You have to receive it. You have to receive it. So this morning, as Greg and the rest play, anybody who wants to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Please come forward. I would be honored to pray with you.